Good morning. That was okay. We can do better. Happy Sunday. And it's a beautiful day in Santa Fe. We are glad you are here at First Baptist of Santa Fe. I don't uh, know about you, but I've already worshipped this morning as I was driving up from uh, Rio Rancho. What just a few days ago had been brown fields and brown hills are now greening up. And then when I topped over the hill coming down into Santa Fe, there was the green that uh, was not that prominent a few days ago. The mountains were blue, but they were covered in clouds and mist. The sun was breaking through and shining on those white clouds around the mountains, turning them a, a just an ethereal white. It was a beautiful and a worshipful scene. So I was able to worship driving here this morning, just seeing the glory of creation, praising him for the rain that we got. Amen. 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 Let's give him a hand for the rain that he has brought us. Yeah. Let's stand this morning, one of our traditional hymns of the faith. Maybe a country fight, just a bit. What a fellowship, what a joy to find Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness, what a peace is mine on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Uh, one of the things I love about Santa Fe is how we have all kinds of people here in this awesome community. And um, really, it's beautiful the way we all kind of melt together. And I will say I love the way Randy can countrify things, don't you? It's awesome. So one of the great... One of the great things we have in Santa Fe is our uh, legacy of country folk. So listen to Psalm 20 as we continue to worship. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord, may the King answer us in the day we call. Welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here today. We'll have an opportunity for you to greet 
each other in just a moment. But would you join me in praying uh, today for our country? It may seem like the 4th of July is a long way off, but this is the Sunday before it. So if a loud firecracker goes off tonight, don't be scared. It's, uh, it's par for the course in this community we live in. So let's pray together for uh, the birthday of our country. God, you commanded us to pray for kings and those in authority in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so in line with that, this morning, we come to you thankful for another birthday of the United States of America. God, we thank you for a country of freedoms. We thank you for law and order. God, we thank you for a government that is by the people and for the people. Thank you so much for the blessing of this country. God, we confess that we know we as a country are far from perfect. God, we confess our faults to you and we ask that you would bring an awakening to what is wrong in our country. God, we ask that you would help us to repent from sin. God, we ask for a more just union. Lord Jesus, we confess together that we know you are the one who brings salvation. And so we ask you for a lot more salvation and revival in our land. God, we do pray this morning for elected officials. God, we pray for military and first responders. God, for all of these, we ask for safety and wisdom. God, we ask that you would help unify our country around the things that are right and good. You would make us more righteous, more just. Again, that you would bring salvation to those in leadership. God, we pray for the voters of our country in an election year. God, we ask for wisdom. We ask, Father, that you would help Christians for us to do that part of our duty that you have called us to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Help us to participate in this country that you've given us. God, and most of all today, as we come underneath the authority of your word, we praise you that the coming king, the perfect ruler of the universe, is coming again. And God, we look forward with great anticipation and expectation of the day that we will see Jesus riding on the clouds, returning to this earth to rule perfectly. All our hope is in you, O Father. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all who have gathered together today to worship you. May we connect with you in this place today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I do see a lot of visitors in the room. We do ask you to fill out the Connect card. It's there in the pew rack in front of you. And you can just place that in the offering plate when it comes by. It's the only offering we would ask of you. Or you also can take it out to the Connect table. We'll have a free gift uh, for you. But we want you to feel welcome. So if you would, stand up, find somebody you don't know, and welcome them to church today. We're glad you're here. You can come up here, that way you have something to, yeah, yeah. never fails me in all the days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God join us as we sing And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good 
with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God Who breaks the power of of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory all this is, is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you have done for me. Who brings our chaos, the 
back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King of glory Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, 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 this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you have done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you have done for me. morning. This is the time in our service that we worship our Lord through our tithes and our offerings. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus tells us that where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. And so our tithes and our offerings help us to reflect a grateful heart to God for all of the many blessings in our lives. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we are truly grateful for all of the blessings in our lives. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for your presence. We ask that you would draw each of us closer to you, that we would walk with you daily, and that our true treasures would lie in heaven with you. At this time, we pray for our offering. We pray for the, that the funds and this church family, that they both would be used so that others may come to know you through them. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. For this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound in Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's stand. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, 
the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoice, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will be. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I tread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. That Jesus died and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and evermore my plea oh the chains and feet I can see I am free yet not I but through Christ in me With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said He will bring me home. And every day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy upon the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Not, not I, but through Christ in me. You may be seated. Good morning. If you would uh, turn to your Bibles in the pew, if you need one of those, that's page 1051. And I will be reading our scripture passage uh, from the NS NASB version. And in Psalm 145, 21, it says, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. So we may bless his holy name today. Luke 21, verses 25 through 36, this is where Jesus speaks. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting from fear and the expectation of the things that are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see for yourselves and know that summer is now near. So you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that this day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of all the earth. But stay alert at all times, praying that you will have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you didn't catch that, the kids are dismissed to Children's Church. Uh, kids, take a parent back with you and make sure uh, we get you a right kid with right parent. One of our goals at FBC. Uh, our Minister of Music, Greg Higgins, is away uh, today spending time with family. And I just want to thank the talented group of lead worshipers that we had to lead us today. Great job, Randy and uh, Marcos and all the rest of you. Beautiful worship through song today. Let's pray as we open God's Word together. Father, thank you for your perfect Word that we just heard read. And now, Father, we ask that the words of my mouth And the meditations of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to you. Again, we're glad that you're here. Uh, We'll hear about it in a minute, but we do have a free uh, Baptist barbecue potluck meal right after church that we would love for you to attend with us uh, down in the CLC right after this service. There'll be no program down there. We'll just pray for the food, but we want you just to fill up a plate and eat and fellowship, have fun uh, celebrating uh, together. We looked last time at the first half of the future predictions here in Luke 21. If you missed last week, I want to give you a special encouragement. I often don't do this, but uh, please do make sure and catch last week's sermon. You can find it on Facebook or YouTube. Um, It's really about the end times, but particularly about how we can trust the Bible when it comes to end times. How so often the confusion surrounding end times creates a, uh, it kind of erodes the trust that we can have in God's word. And so we even restuffed the handout from last week. They actually printed too many, so you get it again. Uh, it might be helpful today, but you would have it to, to catch up that sermon. And this is really part two. We saw here in Luke 21 that Jesus is preparing his disciples to suffer by talking specifically about some coming events that were going to come for them, specifically about how the temple would be destroyed. That conversation begins in verses 5 and 6 here in Luke 21. Jesus says plainly and repetitively that this centerpiece of the Jewish faith was about to be wiped out, the temple. And then within one generation, we'll see it in our passage in verse 32, within 40 years... That is exactly what happened. And the temple has never been rebuilt since. Many people sometimes, because Christians can tend to be kind of less familiar with the Old Testament, will get really curious about the Old Testament worship and temple practices and wonder, well, why don't they exist anymore? They don't exist precisely because of what Jesus is promising here, a judgment towards the Jewish people for rejecting the Messiah. And that is a judgment that has been finalized and for 2,000 years stood. And notice at the end of uh, the passage right before ours, at the end of verse 24, that will happen until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And so until the time of all of the Gentiles, the not, that is non-Jews around the world coming into church, coming into saving faith, until that time is fulfilled, the temple will continue to be Destroyed. By the way, if the temple ever were rebuilt, that would be a great sign of the coming of Christ. We saw last week R.C. Sproul say a prediction that was far out of order when Jesus gave it. 
and yet has been fulfilled with such clear historic evidence from many different sources. This prophecy that the temple would be destroyed and then the fulfillment that would happen 40 years into the future of those disciples in 70 AD by the Roman army. R.C. Sproul said that prophecy and then fulfillment alone should be enough to have any skeptic see that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and worthy of our worship and devotion. How could he make that prediction when the temple was at the height of its popularity? Incredible. This morning we pick up where we left off, and I want us to notice how diligent, diligently Jesus is working here to leave his disciples and us with hope for his return. Maybe you're here this morning and through some circumstances in your life you feel like you just don't have hope that anything is going to really get better. Maybe you feel the pinch of inflation. More, maybe it's more like a, an arm being removed, a cutting off of an arm of inflation. Your dollars seem to disappear quicker than they used to. Maybe you've had some hard, tough health news lately. Maybe the presidential debate has you down. Maybe your family seem to all be struggling and you feel concern over the conflicts and struggles in your family. Maybe your life has just been kind of regular and felt sort of old and routine and repetitive lately. We come this morning to the promise of Jesus that He will return to this earth. And He has hope for all of us in this passage. Look with me together at Luke 21 starting in verse 25, Luke 21, 25. There will be signs in the moon and stars and on the earth dismay among the nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear and expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. As we think through some of what the Bible teaches about the second coming of Christ, in one sense there's just a very simple truth that I want us to get this morning, and that is that it will be bad, unspeakably bad, when Christ returns for those who are still in their sin and have rejected the salvation offer that Jesus gives. On one hand, it will be bad. On, on the other, opposite is true for those who do know Jesus. His return will be great, unimaginably good for Christian people. So notice on your sermon notes, number one, the coming of Jesus Christ means a terrible judgment for those who reject Jesus. All through here in Luke 21, and really almost any passage that refers to the end times, brings up this dichotomy that it's great for people who have trusted in Christ. But it is also a terrible judgment for those who have decided to not believe in Christ. If you look with me at verse 36, for example, 2136, keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So again, we see that there's something coming in the near for which they, want, they need strength to escape. And of course, he began this conversation talking about a, a soon coming of the destruction of the temple. But then all woven throughout here, there's also a sense of the second coming, which would be further out in the future, there in verse 36, to be able to stand before the Son of Man. Verse 27, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Many times throughout the Scripture, that refers to the second coming of Christ. It's in Daniel, it's in Revelation, and, and the Son of Man is coming in a cloud, literally riding on the clouds. There's two time zones that we get. The things that are about to happen and to stand before the returning Christ that will happen further in the future. We saw last week how there is so much that everyone agrees about when it comes to the end times. We want to major on those main ideas. We talked about, yes, there is confusion, but really when it comes to the main ideas of victory in Christ and that believers will go to heaven and that evil will be punished, in reality, there's a ton of agreement on those things. 
We talked about last week how when it comes to the second coming, really the disagreements concern when it will happen. Not that it will happen, but when. Will it, was, was most of what was written about happening more in the past? Was all of it going to be in the future? As I was talking to someone who has always had more of a futuristic mindset about all of the different prophecies about the return of Christ or the end times, we were saying, you know, what's interesting is that everybody would have to agree that when Jesus first said these things, everything was in the future. For all of those first disciples, everything would be in the future. Some things it seems he's saying here were going to happen soon, and other things it seems he was saying would happen further out. And as we read through, if you read through later on your own in Luke 21, you'll see these different time markers, like until all of the Gentiles, the time of all the Gentiles has been fulfilled. Well, that seems like a slightly longer period of time, doesn't it? All of the Gentiles that are Christians having to come into the church. Would that take some time maybe? So the Bible teaches us from the beginning to end that Christ will judge the world. And if that's true, then isn't it loving of Jesus to warn the world of coming judgment? Let's just say if you're here today and you would say, man, some of these things are a little disconcerting to me. They should be if we're understanding them correctly. He would say, man, I don't know what I think about judgment. We're going to talk about that today. But I want us just to, from, from the get-go, from the up front, to say if there really is going to be a judgment on this world, what would be the most loving thing we could do? Wouldn't it be to warn people of that coming judgment? Revelation contains several promises of blessing for people who will heed the warnings of Revelation. Listen to right there in the first chapter of Revelation, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. One of the themes of the Bible is these times are coming soon, and so we want to be careful to talk about these things. And to warn one another and those who haven't believed yet that Christ is returning. Revelation begins that way, it ends that way, doesn't it? Maybe you're here and you still, you're like, read, judgment, the time is near, second coming, what are you talking about? Let me see if I can try to summarize the story of the Bible. The Bible begins in Genesis by saying that God created this world in love. Mankind, man and, men and women are made in His image. Every human being is a unique, loved creation of God. God then endowed humanity with wonderful abilities to think and reason and know right from wrong. Abilities that other beasts of the creation simply do not have. God built us for a relationship with Him and gave us perfect peace, wholeness with God in the garden. Everything was as it should be when mankind was first created. But Adam and Eve, along with every one of us, used those abilities to think and reason that were given to us to rule God's creation righteously. And we decided we don't want to go God's way, we want to go our own way. To sin simply means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. Almost immediately, mankind was sinning with murder and conflict, and jealousy, and blame. Our rule over God's creation was immediately to add to God's beauty the ugliness of our own unrighteousness and injustice. But because God is just, He had to act. And so death entered the world upon our sin. God punished all of the ways we hurt each other by proclaiming the wages of sin is death, Paul says in Romans. The sin of rebelling against God and hurting one another is so serious to God that it requires death. To misuse His creation is to be removed from His creation, our Creator says. But the Bible is full of good news. God continues to show His faithful love in the story of the Bible. No matter how far away His people wander away from Him, God is still pursuing a relationship with creation, His humanity. We see in the Old Testament story that judges and kings and prophets, no human 
path of ridding the world of sin works or had ability. Sin is, is like an evil little brother that will never go away and always causing problems in your life. We see it in the Bible and we see it in our own lives, don't we? That the Old Testament shows us we need God to deal with our sin. We read at the beginning of the service today, some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. The verse before says God will save through His anointed And I hope you remember every time you see that word anointed in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word Messiah. And so that verse before is saying that God will save through the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus. And the Bible is showing nothing will work to deal with our sin. The Old Testament and the New are saying the same thing. Only through this Savior that God will send will our sin be able to be dealt with. Listen to how the closing words of the Old Testament. Do you know how the Old Testament closes the last words of the Old Testament? Well, it's Malachi chapter 4. And listen to the, the dueling promises that are here at the end of Malachi. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, not me saying this is God, so that it will leave them with neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, us, the Son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves being led out from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances I command him in Horeb for all of Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. So I will not come and smite the land with a curse. That's the closing words. Listen to it again. He, this Savior, Elijah-like Savior, will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. God promises that He will bless all of the world through this Messiah-like Savior that He's going to send. Of course, when Jesus arrives on the scene, starting in Matthew, the next page in the Bible, we begin to see how he is going to deal with our sin. We don't do it. Jesus is able to do it. In fact, we see just as sinful a humanity in the New Testament as in the Old, but we see Jesus being different. The way he loved people, the way that people who were never religious before loved being around Jesus. And he tells us all who believe in him, as Savior and Lord or King, will find that Jesus is able to break the power of sin as His kindness transforms us from the inside to the out. Listen to how, I I always say John 3.16, so I thought I'd better use a different verse. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy. We have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers saying the same thing. We have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. So how can you and I be saved from the wrath of God against our sin? What we deserve in the way we have hurt other people. How in the world can we be saved from those things that we have done? And God executing His wrath against those who have destroyed His creation. How can we be saved? Paul says, by believing. A person becomes a Christian not by having a Christian heritage or Christian parents or Christian grandparents or having a preacher in your family. Those things are good for the most part, I hope, for my family. Anyways, a person becomes a Christian by personally trusting in Jesus Christ to be one Savior and Lord. We say ABC to admit I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. A, admit to be, believe 
on Christ as my Savior and Lord. And see, to confess Him as my Lord, I'm going to start following His way now. Imperfectly, yes, but I'm going to follow my new King. And then finally, a key aspect of the Bible's teaching about this gospel message is always that Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. The Messiah will come a first time, and then the Messiah will come a second time. You can even see in the Old Testament, it predict that the first coming will be a time of grace, and the second coming will be a time of judgment. So what this means when Christ returns as He's promising here, notice first in your sermon notes, it's a terrible day for people who have not believed in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It is a day of judgment. And those people will receive punishment for a lifetime of sin. Notice there in verse 36, they won't be able to stand. It's a judgment that the Bible has shown. There is no human way to say it, to stand, except for through God's power, the power that rose Christ from the grave. Perhaps you're here today, and the whole time I've been talking about hell or wrath or the judgment of God, you're like, oh my goodness, what church is this that I wandered into? Hell, fire, and brimstone, oh my goodness. We just try to teach what the Bible says. And it says that, Jesus, and I hope you see, it is a a message of love. But I want to give you four truths to think about. These fall under number one. If you struggle with these ideas of hell and judgment, think about these four truths. Number one, God is just, all of them are God is just. God is just to bring judgment because it's what sin deserves. Think about how if somebody murdered someone in your family, what would you desire? You would desire justice. For that loss. It's right for a thief to have to pay back what was stolen. If somebody stole 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 from your family, would you not desire that to be paid back? Some, Some justice. Sin is a defilement of God's creation and He's watching. And He says there will be a day of justice. It's just For God to bring judgment. It's what sin deserves. Number two, God is just to judge sinners because that's what the sinful heart wants. Life without God. God is just to judge sinners because that's what the sinful heart wants. Life apart from God. This judgment is perfectly just because God is giving the unbeliever what he or she wants when they say, no thanks, I don't want your God. One day... God will remove, the the Bible says in Colossians that it is Christ that holds all things together. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, the Father of lights with whom there there is no change. God is full of light and love and beauty and truth. The beauty that we see in creation, all of that is God's. And so for God to give the sinner what he, they say they want and to completely remove his presence is a part of the justice of, of, of wrath and judgment. Third, God is just to judge evil because God is giving all of humanity what it has said it wants. That is the removal of all that is bad in the world. Pretty much everybody I know in, huma- in humanity who watches the news feel like, man, there's stuff wrong in the world. And this goes for believers in Christ and unbelievers. And they say, I want this stuff out of here. For me, one of the the, the just low points was in 2022 when here in New Mexico, that mom threw her baby in a dumpster. I just thought, "What, what? What is happening? Oh, that the evil and the cruelty of this world would be done with forever. Humanity longs for the day that all of the wrong is removed. God is just to give it to us because we're asking for it. We're praying for it, are we not? Fourth and finally, Jesus Christ is right to judge those who have rejected him because he took the wrath of God for those who have believed in him. 
Jesus bore on the cross the complete wrath of God towards sin for any who would trust in Him so that He can offer us salvation. Remember Him praying the night before the cross and the sweat droplets of blood. And He's like, God, if there's any way you could take the cross away from me or this cup of judgment, I want it. But He says, not my will, but yours be done. And He bears the wrath of God for us to offer us salvation. The rest of the world is saying no thanks to that kindness and that love of Christ to die on the cross for us. I know these things are not easy to think about, but I pray these four things will give you a little bit of something to think about, that it's what sin deserves. God is just to bring these things. It's what sin deserves. We want justice in the world. God is just to judge sinners because it's what the sinful heart wants, a life apart from God. God is just to do this because all of humanity is crying out for evil to be removed from the world. God is about to remove it. And fourth and finally, Jesus Christ is right to judge because he bore the wrath of God so that Christians would not have to endure the judgment. And he is offering a gift of of freedom from that judgment for any who want it now. Verse 36, those who will stand in the judgment are those who have become Christians by trusting in God. That is the only way to stand through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who rose, defeating Satan, sin, and death by the power of God. You know, one of the things we see repeated in Revelation, you could even even maybe make this number five if you wanted it. All through Revelation, the throngs of heaven are crying out in worship to God. And one of the repeated things they say are how just are His judgments. Have you ever noticed that? One of the very things that we struggle with when it comes to the second coming is repeated in heaven, how just are His judgments. So you and I might could say, we aren't going to understand it now. But one day we're going to look down and we're going to see Christ face to face and we're going to realize what all of this earth was worth and and why it happened and why God did it the way he did. And we're going to say, how just are your judgments? How perfect are your ways? So for those not in Christ, it's a bad day. But notice second, for the Christian, the day of Christ's return will be completely good in every way way. It's just in line with what I was just saying. Second, it will be a wonderful welcome home for Christians. Look with me at verse 27. 21, 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. As we've read Luke 21, we've seen there are things here that seem so historic. As we look there at at verse 6, as these things, the day will come when there's not one stone left upon another, as they're talking about the temple. It seems so clear that was the destruction of the temple. But here in verse 27, we clearly now are talking about the second coming of Christ. Jesus mentions several aspects of how good his return is going to be for us that are here in the text. So this phrase, the the son of man coming with the clouds, is the moment the earth will see Jesus Christ in his fullness. It's promised in Daniel. This same promise that he'll come riding the clouds is echoed again in Revelation. This will be the moment that the whole earth will see Jesus Christ face to face in glory. And the question is going to be on that day, who knows and loves him? Remember what we studied last week? Jesus is going to say to some people on Judgment Day, people are going to say to Jesus, well, didn't we do a whole bunch of good religious stuff for you? And you remember what he says in Matthew? Depart from me, I never knew you. To those who know Christ by faith, who have a relationship, we will be ready to know Him in His fullness. I think that's another reason that God is just, is that the people who haven't had a a transformation of soul, the glory of God will be too much. They can't be in the glory of God and live. Incidentally, this phrase, the Son of Man, is Jesus' favorite phrase for himself. It's uh, really mainly in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. It's in the Psalms too. But listen to Daniel chapter 7. He has this vision of the Son of Man coming with the clouds. Daniel seven thirteen. I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven. 
one like a son of man coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Man, I don't know about you, I, I love the United States. I think it's a great country. But do we know that it is a, a kingdom that will one day fall to the risen king? That all crowns will be laid at the feet of Jesus. And the only kingdom that is an everlasting kingdom, the only dominion that is an everlasting dominion is the dominion of Jesus Christ. And we see He's a ruler that is a perfect ruler. It really helps us to understand more of this second coming. You know, in most angelic or God appearances in the Bible, people fall down scared. That's the main reaction of people when they see an angel or they see God in His glory is just trembling with fear. Often it says paralyzed with fear. And I think this Son of Man title helps us to realize what we're going to see when we see Him riding on those clouds. He's going to look like a man. He's the Son of Man. We know good Christology is that Jesus was 100% God, is 100% God, and is 100% man. And so I think we'll have fear and reverence, yes. But the Bible says His sheep will know His voice. And I think when we see Him, it will be a great day for Christians Because we will see, oh, I I recognize his humanity and the most beautiful human I've ever seen before. Look at verse 28. When these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption means to buy back or to make a payment that frees a slave. At the moment of Christ's coming, Christians will experience, second, a completion of our redemption. So everything good that you have felt in your Christian life, everything good that has given you a sense of what it means to know Christ and walk with Him, you will feel a completion of those things. The completion of redemption. We become redeemed the moment we call on Christ for salvation, but as we know, it's already and it's not yet. It will be finished on the day that He returns. We'll feel totally free from sin in every way. Think about how cool that's going to be. You will never be grumpy ever again. No more bad attitudes or sadness or sickness or death. I saw some of you looking at each other just now. I didn't mean for that to happen. We'll have an experience that will be the most beautiful human experience that we've ever felt that will move on for eternity. We'll feel bought totally and completely free of the clutches of Satan, sin, and death, mourning and crying and pain, all gone forever. Jesus gives an example of what it's going to be like from nature. Look with me at verse 29. Then he told them a parable, Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, as soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. So what he's saying is that the second coming will have to it, third, a sweetness, like the ripening of fruit. The figs are almost ready, he's saying. Amy and I uh, bought some peaches at the store the other day, and we uh, cut them open, and when we all ate them, our, our mouths all turned bitter. They were awful. They were bad. My first job outside of my family and my home when I was in high school was to work in the produce department of a grocery store. And uh, sometimes our bosses there in that produce department, they wanted us to taste the fruit. So we would be able to tell people if it was ripe or maybe if it needed more time so they would know and we could be honest. We also would regularly cut fruit for people, let them try it. And I can remember biting into fruit over the summers that I worked there. That was so juicy and sweet and yet not heavy, but refreshing. And we would say, that tastes like heaven. 
Jesus is saying his kids are going to see Christ coming on the clouds and our hearts will leap for joy. We'll feel encouraged and excited like biting into sweet, ripe fruit. And we'll know it's true because it's forth a fulfillment of God's word. Look at the next verses there, 32 and 33. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place, giving us a signal that we, some of it had to happen in that generation. Verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away. And notice again, I think this adds to verse 32, that heaven and earth are also going to pass away, but they don't necessarily apply to the generation as I read that. But my words will not pass away. When we see Christ coming, we'll say, there he is, just as he promised. Remember, that can be at any time. Maybe you say, okay, okay, Christ is going to return, but man, pastor, what does that have to do with me in 2024? Am I just supposed to wait around forever? Am I just supposed to sit on my high knee on the couch and just twiddle my thumbs and wait? Absolutely not. I'm going to get just super practical here as we finish up. What are we supposed to do while we wait for the second coming of Christ? In 2 Peter, Peter is dealing with the fact that uh, the Christians were noticing this is, part of this is taking a long time. And this is what Peter says. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. It's the verse connected to with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Peter connects the slowness of Christ's return with God's heart that more people would come into the church and be saved. Again, we see the goodness and grace of God. Notice how that heart is reflected in what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to have an active waiting that helps people become Christians. That's our job while we wait. Remember, all these events were in the future for those original disciples, including the destruction of the temple. And Jesus tells them all sorts of things throughout this whole passage that he wants them to be doing as they wait. So we're going to go back up into the passage right above this to pull out some of these things. We must actively wait, first of all, by speaking our testimony. Look at what it says up in verse 13. 21, 13. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. What's it? It's that they are, people are laying their hands on you and persecuting you and delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. So we are supposed to be ready to speak our testimony. But maybe for some of you, you just had a gulp in your heart. and You're like, I can't do that. Pastor, there's no way I can speak my testimony. I don't even know what it is. How am I supposed to do that? Well, keep reading. Look at verse 15. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents, opponents will be able to resist or refute. In other words, don't, don't, he says in verse 14, don't make up your minds before and all that you're going to say. Trust the Holy Spirit to lead you in what to say. I had a friend, Barry Frost in Amarillo, who had lived a, a pretty party-oriented life. He was a a fairly successful car dealer, but he had ruined his body in the car dealership culture with drugs and alcohol and parties. He had grown up as a Christian, but wandered far away. And finally, his doctor one day said, Barry, you're going to die, and it may be soon. And that was the wake-up call that he needed to start walking with Christ. And he started walking with Christ for at least the last 15 years of his life very seriously. He had a kidney transplant, a liver transplant. We might say he needed Christ to go through those things. They ended up taking off part of his leg because his organs weren't functioning. All of those horrible changes. And yet, Barry would tell you if he were here today, that's the happiest he had ever been in his life. I would watch Barry the closer he got to his death, and I was there in the hospital with him all the time. He got more and more excited to talk about Jesus. Every nurse, every doctor, everybody who helped him, he had this huge smile on his face, and he was so excited to tell them about what Christ had done for him and that there was nobody beyond God's forgiveness. There is no powerlessness in Christ. You are not powerless, powerless as you wait for Christ to return. You have a testimony that God intends for you to use. 
The powerlessness comes from just not being willing to open the mouth and to speak. You know, in Revelation 12, it's the final judgment against Satan. And a voice proclaims from heaven that they, that is the Christian brethren, it's Christ's brothers, us, overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, what Christ had done, and the power of our testimony. Speak, Christians, about what Christ has done for you and watch God use it. Jesus says, as all this stuff is happening, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So may we speak. He says, second, expect betrayal. For time's sake, I'm going to move on, but expect it. Third, rest in the protection of Christ. A great part of what believers must learn to do as we wait is to allow the presence and power of Christ to invade our souls. Not everything we're supposed to do as Christians is doing. A lot of it is receiving. We have to receive to be able to go and speak our testimony. We have to learn to abide in Christ, Jesus says, like a branch connected to a vine. Christians have to learn to spend time with God, resting in the promises that He has given you. If you're feeling anxiety today about what you see in this world, I would ask you, how much time are you spending meditating on the promises of God versus meditating on the worries of the present day? Worry and anxiety are meditations on untruths. We have to learn to meditate on the truth and to get it in. And Verse 18 is a promise. Not a hair on your head will be harmed. It's worth uh, mentioning a little commentary there. Jesus wants his believers to follow his word, to understand that is the safest place to be. Is he promising no persecution for Christians? No, he just said to expect it. We have to hold those things together. Jesus was killed. But being in the presence of God is the safest place for a Christian's spirit. Because if somebody harms our body one day, we wake up to the face of Jesus. One of the key misunderstandings about the second coming of Christ that Paul wants to correct with the Thessalonians is that the dead will be with the Lord. But at the resurrection, they don't get to beat us to being with the Lord. It says we will meet them in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Paul tells us in Thessalonians, we're always with the Lord. It's the safest place to be, walking with Him, resting in the protection that He gives. And that's why we've got to speak the Word. Remember what it said? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. How to speak the Word. Jesus says, my word cannot be moved or shaken. No army can budge my word an inch. In these days when we see political leaders talk about things that it seems like we can't trust a word that they say. Sometimes I want to say, then why are we putting so much hope in them and spending so little time in the word, which we can trust with our very lives? The psalmist says that one meditates on the word of God is like a tree planted by streams of water. That's the work that Christ calls us to do while we're waiting, to send our roots down into the Word and presence of God. And you're in church today. You're doing that great job. We got to hear uh, kids in our VBS recite whole chapters of the Word of God. So some of us have some work to do to catch up just with our kids. It's an anchor for our souls. It's another very practical thing to do while we wait is to not just be out there speaking to others, but to make sure we're allowing the word to speak to us and to correct us. How then will they call on them in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Paul says in Romans 10. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the word there is not preacher like me, but a proclaimer. We need to proclaim the word to each other one-on-one and one in small groups and one on large groups. We all are called to the proclaiming of the word of God. I'm totally out of time, but we're also called to avoid sinful waiting. If you look at there uh, in verse 34, you'll see dissip- dissipation, which is partying and then drunkenness. What do people do when they get bored? They start drinking, getting drunk. And notice how Jesus anticipates this 2,000 years ago. And he's telling us, you don't have time for that. You've got to be awake and alert. You need to stay alert and on guard. This passage finishes and praying at all times. 
David Gooding writes this. As surely as those men and women standing in Jerusalem once saw Jesus just a few days before descending the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey's colt, so surely Jesus is telling them here one day they will see Jesus likewise descend the heavens riding on a cloud. Not then shall He come meek and lowly as He once did on that donkey's colt. Now He will come full of glory in the carriage of deity. Not on a borrowed donkey, but His advanced preparations will be the roaring of the sea and the shaking of the heavens. Charles Wesley wrote it up like this. Lo, He comes with clouds descending. Once for favored sinners slain, thousands, thousand saints attending, swell the triumph of his train. Alleluia, alleluia. God appears on earth to reign. My favorite is this. Queen Elizabeth I, and she ruled England in the, the 1500s. We typically associate her with Shakespeare and romanticism, poetry, that kind of stuff. But she really was one of the most powerful and, and longest reigning rulers of her time. She's been outdone now by our, 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 the queen just here a few years ago before she passed. But truth be told, ruling in the 1500s would have been a tough job. The world changed a ton in the 1500s, much like it has done in the last century. Listen to what she said. She says, I wish I could be alive when Christ returns. Because I would like to be the first earthly monarch to take my crown and lay it at His feet. I wish I could be alive when Christ returns. Because I would like to be the first earthly monarch to take my crown and lay it at His feet. Friend, I don't know what you have in your life that you're proud of. It's good to do things that we are proud of, that we can look back on with some admiration. Man, I, I'm glad I did that. But I want to ask you, are you ready to see Jesus descending on the clouds in fullness of His glory? We'll recognize Him, we'll know Him, He will be more beautiful than we could have ever dreamed, but are you ready to meet Him? Would he say on that day, I know Shirley. I know Jack. Come into my everlasting comfort. Are you still on the outside? And he would say to you, depart from me. I, I don't know you. I don't want that to be you. I'm so glad you're here today. And I invite you to make Jesus your king today. Do not wait he gives us these warnings out of great love for a terrible day of judgment that is coming for the unbeliever and a glorious day of the beginning of heaven that He wants you to be a part of. May you do it and be there by faith. Let's pray. God, we thank You for the clarity of Your Word. God, may we never hide behind the, the prophecies and the warnings of your second coming, saying, oh, they're confusing, I don't get it, when really we all get the big ideas. Everybody's pretty much on the same page. You are returning. God, if there's somebody here who has been waiting and putting it off to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day when they say, okay, no more. I'm ready. May they trust in you, put their faith in you. We're going to have our time of invitation right now and just ask you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed as we uh, love for this to be an attitude and just a, a time of prayer for each one of us. If you're here today and you're saying, I am ready to become a Christian, I'm not going to embarrass you. The way to do that is just right where you are to admit your sin to God, to tell God you trust Him, to tell Jesus you trust Him and believe in Him as the risen Savior and Lord of your life. And you want to start a relationship with Him. Just tell Him what we've been talking about today. 
and that you want to follow him as your Lord and King. He will save you. And that day will be a good day for you. If you're here today and maybe you have been so distracted by the things of this world that you haven't been doing any of those eternal things that we're supposed to be doing while we wait. Maybe for you today needs to be a day of recommitting yourself to the things that our Lord has called us to do. I invite you to do that. Would you have a moment of prayer and silence and then as you uh, feel led, you can stand and sing as Randy leads us. If you have any public decisions to make, I'll meet you in the front. Let's keep seated and prayerful and then as you feel, feel ready, you can stand and sing. Lead us, Randy. Stand if you would. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Till it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in any things, no gifts, no power, no treasure, but only they in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom You may be seated. Hi, church family. If you'll look at the announcements in the bulletin with me. Um, First, this week on July 4th, the office is closed. And also, we have a new thing happening on Sunday. We have a nursery for infants to three years old during connection group time. And that's at 9.15 to 10.15. So please come if you have little ones and you'll have class for them and you'll have class for you. Um, The student ministry is getting ready to go off to camp. So please be praying for them and their sponsors. We all know it's a wonderful time to reconnect and see what kind of journey our kids are going to go on as they meet their Lord and Savior at camp in Colorado. So please pray for their travel safeties and uh, salvation experiences and rededications in their walk with the Lord. 
One announcement that's not in your bulletin is today at 4 p.m. at the Capitol Roundhouse, there's going to be a statewide uh, worship rally. So remember that. And then uh, most importantly, right after I get through talking, is the Independence Day barbecue down here in the Christian Life Center, right out down here. And we'd like for you to line up in the hallway right there by the gymnasium, and um, you'll go through the line there. So thank you very much, and please come. We have lots of food. Thanks, Tammy. Great job doing our announcements. We've got all kinds of cool, talented people here. Uh, they opened up this way is the, for those of you that are uh, in wheelchairs, the ramps go out this way. Uh, the rest of you, if you want, you can make it, make your way down the hall and then down the steps at the very end of the hall and that will take you into our Christian Life Center. Uh, the kitchen team asked me to tell you that we're starting out in the hallway. If you want to go find your seat and put your stuff down, you can. Uh, and they're going to try to uh, get you through the hallway line as fast as possible. And then once you're out uh, back into the gym, there will be two lines to go down and get all of the delicious uh, salads, sides, and desserts that all of you made. I know Chris was hoping for three times the amount of desserts as healthy things. So, uh, man, we're so glad that you're here. Everybody's invited to come eat with us. We hope you'll uh, enjoy that time with us. There's, again, no, um, no program down there. And in fact, I'm not going to pray down there. I'm going to pray right now for our food because uh, the last two weeks, the acoustic panels have been added into the gym. That's all finished. And so you should be able to hear slightly better in there. So that's a little blessing of God that you can look around and, and just notice and uh, maybe hear the difference uh, with your ears. So uh, we're really, really thankful all of that is done. But uh, we, because of all that, I don't know if the sound system's hooked up in there yet. So why don't I just pray for our food right now before I dismiss this. So let's, uh, let's stand together. I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. If you're not going to eat with us, we just thank you so much for being here today. God, it's hard to think about judgment. But if we're an honest reader of the Bible, and unfortunately so many people claiming to be teachers today are not, from Genesis to Revelation, you make very clear there is a coming judgment. It's all over the prophets. Jesus, it's all over your words. We just read a lot of them today. I pray you would put every Christian heart at ease. That they're, they're headed for the best day they could ever experience in their lives that will go on forever. And I pray that you would put the saving good news of Jesus Christ all the more on our lips for how important it is to save people from that day. God, we trust you to do the saving. May we do the speaking and the loving. Surely I am coming soon, the Lord says. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. God, may you bless this food we're about to partake to the blessing of our bodies and our bodies to your service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today.